Christian Church. This is Taven, and I'm super excited uh, to be joining you here on Easter morning, and, and happy Resurrection Sunday. We are super excited to be with you. Uh, I, didn't, I can't lie, I didn't imagine this would be our first uh, Easter together, um, but as the Lord provides, we, we go, and uh, we're super thankful that the Lord's provided this medium in order to communicate His, his message, His gospel uh, through this. But um, just wanted to share with you a couple thoughts um, on this Resurrection Sunday. I, I really love the story of the two disciples on the Emmaus Road. Um, it's found in Luke chapter 24, if, if you uh, are familiar with the story. Um, it's about these two guys who, who had um, seen the things of, of Good Friday and uh, experienced the silence of, of Saturday. But um, on, on Sunday, uh, they had caught wind from, from the gals who had visited the tomb that he was alive and he had risen. And it, it's, so they were kind of just mulling these things over, not sure they hadn't necessarily experienced for themselves that the risen Lord. Um, but a stranger joined them uh, on the way. And, and um, as they were traveling, they started discussing the scriptures. They, they asked the stranger, like, have you not heard about the things going on that this guy who, who claimed to be the Messiah was crucified? And then he, he's, uh, we hear that he has resurrected, but we, we can't be sure of our, for ourselves. Um, it, it's really intriguing that Jesus then goes along and, and shares with them the gospel message through the Old Testament. He, he translates the scriptures through Moses, through the present. It, it is really incredible. You, you should go back and read it. But um, as they sit down and, and gather for, for, uh, for some dinner, the, the disciples um, urged this stranger, they, who they didn't know was Jesus, to, to stay with them because he was going to go on and continue traveling. But, but Jesus was persuaded, and he sat down with them. And it, when he, it says when they broke bread, when he broke bread, the disciples' eyes were open and were, were recognizing that this was Jesus. And after that, Jesus quickly disappears from their sight. Uh, but down in verse 32, it picks up and says, They said to each other, Weren't our hearts burning within us while he was talking with us on the road and explaining the scriptures to us? I, I'm reminded because this, for them, was a fresh wind of hope. This was a time that they were wrestling through a lot of things, that, they, that their community of believers were, were going through really stressful times. But this hope... That of Jesus being resurrected, that the, Jesus Christ being resurrected from the third day, it, get, it invigorated them so much that they actually, uh, all the travel that they had done, they undid and ran back to the disciples just to testify that, yes, this Lord, this Jesus is risen. And, and later on it says that as they were talking about these things, Jesus showed up in the room and, and confirmed that he actually had risen. And I, I pray that today that you are, are going to be Blessed by this message of Ask, Seek, Knock, we're, we're going to be talking about prayer through knocking, and, and I'm really excited to, to join you in this, in this message, but um, really, I really want you to focus in on that we have a message that is going to bring hope, that Jesus Christ is risen today. We celebrate this today, but He has been risen for the past 2,000 years. He is alive and He is active, and we get to celebrate that in our walks with Him. And so, if you want to mind, we're just going to say a word of prayer and then hop right into our message. Lord, we thank you for your resurrection. We thank you for the hope that you have given in us so that we might be able to share it with others. And, and Lord, if anything else, that we get to say that the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is on our lips and on our minds and on our hearts, Lord. I pray that you give us the word to say and, and the peace of mind and the peace of heart to, to share that with somebody in our context, in our neighborhood, and as, in any way possible, whether it be just dropping groceries by with an encouraging word from, from your Bible, Lord, or um, just sending a note to a, to a family friend, whatever that may look like. Let it be just for your gospel advancement always. We love you, and it's Jesus, I pray. Amen. God bless in this message, and I look forward for you being encouraged. Hello, Mid-Rivers. 
friends, and family. And happy Easter. We're going to do two things today. We're going to talk about how Easter, the resurrection of Jesus, is a game changer. We also are going to follow along in the series that we've been in, in Matthew chapter 7, looking at verses 7 through 11. Uh, we've looked at two things, ask and seek, but this week we're going to finish up with looking at what it means to knock. I've entitled the sermon this morning, Knocking on Heaven's Door, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you, will sh you shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Now, this is the third week we've looked at this passage. Uh, I hope you don't think I'm like the preacher who went to a new church and, and uh, he preached his sermon. The second week, uh, the first week went pretty well. The second week, he came back to his church and he preached the same sermon over again. Uh, the people in the church were a little kind of confused about that. They were a little dumbfounded, and, uh, but they didn't say anything. He was brand new. They didn't want to offend him. And, and so they were curious. The third week came, and, and, and people came into the building, and, and the curiosity and the anticipation was almost palpable. They were curious, is he going to preach the same sermon again? And sure enough, he preached the same sermon again. Same sermon three weeks in a row. Well, somebody just couldn't help themselves, and they went up to the preacher and they said, Hey, preacher, uh, you've preached that same sermon three weeks in a row. Don't you have any other sermons that you can preach? And he says, I sure do. He says, but when you guys get this one down and start practicing it, then I'll preach a different sermon. Now, that's not the reason that we're looking at this passage three weeks in a row. Uh, but Zig Ziglar did say that repetition is the mother of learning. And repetition can be good because sometimes even when we hear something, uh, we don't fully grasp it. Even when we know something or believe something, uh, we don't fully uh, catch hold of that until it's repeated. And so repetition sometimes is the mother of learning. We see this very thing happening to the early church and to the early believers in the book of Acts chapter 12. In the book of Acts chapter 12, it says Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Now, uh, we see that Peter was in prison, and we see God's people, the church, earnestly praying. It would seem as though they're practicing Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. They're asking, they're seeking, and they're knocking on the door of heaven. They're praying to God for Peter. But we'll come back to this story a little bit later. Back to our passage, Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. Now, what is this passage all about? I learned years ago in seminary, if you want to know what a passage is all about, then you need to look roundabout. In other words, you need to look at the verses around that verse. Uh, you need to look at the context. You, you need to understand why those verses were put where they are and why uh, those verses were spoken. What was the occasion or the context through which and under which those words were said. Well, when we do that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, some scholars believe that what Jesus is doing is he's using a typical form of literary Hebrew uh, writing and speaking, and he's simply uh, repeating the phrase. He's using three different phrases, three different terms to get the same point across. Ask, seek, and knock. And then there are some scholars who don't believe that's the case at all. They believe we see levels here of priority or levels of action, ask being the first level, seeking being the second level, and knocking being the third level. Whichever way you see it, uh, when we look at the context in the first six verses leading up to verse seven, we discover that some people were experiencing uh, relational problems. Uh, personal relationships, relationship troubles. 
uh, some people were having trouble with other people. Jesus was giving advice. And then it's on the heels of that that he says, when you have relationship troubles, we need to ask. We need to seek. We need to knock. We need to go to God in prayer. So when we're struggling, when we have difficulties, Jesus is encouraging us to knock on the door of heaven to go to our Father in prayer. I want to hit the pause button just for a moment. I want to ask you, are you going through troubles? Are there some difficulties that you are dealing with? Certainly all of us are in this together and, 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 and all of us have been thrown off kilter with, with what's happened in the recent weeks. And for some, uh, that may bring some added strain and some added stress. Can I encourage you, take a moment today and just pray and ask God, to give you the answers. Ask God to give you some peace. Seek the answer that God has for you. Knock on heaven's door. Go to him in prayer. Because he says in verse 7, uh, the one who knocks, when we knock, the door will be opened to us. Now, I want to look at this in a new lens. We've, we've hit upon this. We've hinted at this for several weeks. But I, I, I want to kind of reframe this verse and, and, and take a new look, if you will, see it through a new filter. You know, when, when you think about uh, this verse, ask and it will be given, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open. At first, on the one hand, it seems rather reassuring. Uh, it's encouraging. It's hopeful and it's helpful. But I I, I want you to think about what Jesus is saying in these verses. He's saying, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. When you think about it, that's quite a claim. That's pretty bold. It's rather brash, even brazen. It's almost hard to believe. Ask and it'll be given, really? Seek and I'll find, really? Knock and it'll be open, really? Is that what he really means? Seems audacious, doesn't it? Outlandish, bodacious. But you know, that's not the first time Jesus had some rather striking statements to share. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 2, uh, he, he, was, he, he healed a man who was paralyzed. And in this chapter, uh, he says to him, Take heart, son. Your sins are forgiven. Now, for Jesus to say that in the first century, the Jews understood exactly what he meant. And they accused him of blasphemy because only God had the authority and the power to forgive sins. In John chapter 8, verse 58, Before Abraham was born, Jesus said, I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. And he went so far as to say in John chapter 10, verse 30, I and the Father are one. I and the Father are one. What a shocking claim. In the book of John chapter 11 verse 25, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. You see, Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And because of that, he dealt a knockout blow to both death and the grave. I love the book of Matthew, chapter 28, verse 6. After Jesus had died, the women were going to the tomb. And when they arrived, they noticed the stone was rolled away, and they met an angel. And the angel said to them, He is not here, he is risen. He is not here. He is risen. He is risen indeed. That's what we celebrate at this Easter season. You see, the promise of Matthew 7, 8 is backed up by the power of Matthew 28. Because Jesus arose from the grave, because Jesus was the Son of God, Jesus has the power 
to forgive sins. Jesus has the authority to solve your problems. Jesus has the power to, to take care of the difficulties and the troubles and to be able to answer the prayers. And we can go to him and we can ask and we can seek and we can knock. Now, I have an admission to make, and, and I've shared this before, but ever so often, I kind of enjoy watching UFC Fight Night. Now, I know some of you, it's not your favorite, uh, but once in a while, they have a special on there, and it's called uh, UFC Greatest Knockouts. And I mean to tell you, they'll have a whole hour of nothing but the most incredible uh, knockouts you would ever see. I, I mean, it's just beyond belief. I mean, sometimes it's difficult to watch. It's, it's brutal. It, it, it's so final. And, and, and you'll see two fighters fighting, and, and out of nowhere, one will throw a punch, and he'll throw a haymaker, and he'll hit a guy square in the nose, and that guy will just drop to the canvas. I mean, he will drop like a rock, or somebody will throw a kick and hit a guy in the head, and boom, down he goes. It's a knockout blow. I mean, he is not moving. It is finished. Isn't it interesting that when Jesus hung upon the cross, he said, it is finished. You see, he dealt a knockout blow to death and to the grave. He says this, the Apostle Paul in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 10, he describes this. It says, our Savior Jesus Christ has abolished death and he has brought life and immortality through the gospel. Notice what it says. He has abolished death. He has, he has knocked it out. He has defeated death. He has destroyed death. And because of his life, because of his resurrection, which we celebrate at Easter time, he has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. I want to ask you a question. Do you believe that Christians today really live, really live in the reality of that promise. I mean, do they really understand that Jesus lived, died, and rose again, and because he lived, died, and rose again, that we too will someday rise again? Folks, if we really get a hold of that, that will change everything we do. It will impact our lives. It will change the way you think. It will change the way you talk. It will change the way you have faith. It will change the way you act. It will change the way you treat your mate. It will change the way you deal with your children. It will change the way you work. It will change the way you treat people around you. It will change the way you live. One of our members shared a rather profound thought. Uh, Karen said this, This Easter, perhaps more than any other before, we can relate to the early Christians of the first century who on Easter morning were huddled in their homes afraid to go out in public because of societal circumstances. How appropriate is that? And when we read Acts chapter 12, I told you we would come back to this, we see that very thing. We see in Acts chapter 12, excuse me, I'm running ahead, uh, Acts chapter 12, that the early church was huddled together in a house. And we looked earlier in Acts chapter 12 verse 5 that they were praying for Peter. I want to look just a little bit at Acts chapter 12, the first few verses. Uh, we find in verse 2, uh, the reason they were huddled in the house is because James, the brother of John, had been put to death by the sword. Uh, James, the brother of John, King Herod, 
had him put to death. Now, I get a little kick out of this because I think there's a little bit of humor in Scripture. It seems to me almost every place I believe except one, when James is mentioned, he's always mentioned as the brother of John. Uh, have you ever had that in your family? Uh, he, he's not known by who he is. He's always tagged with the moniker of he's James, the brother of John. Everywhere he's listed. And here, even in his death, even in his death, he's tagged. I don't know if he was the younger brother. Uh, I don't know if he was the older brother, but he was always called the brother of John. Uh, I remember when I first got married, uh, my wife and her family had traveled the country, and they knew a lot of people in a lot of churches and a lot of places, and we would go to a convention, and they had sung in probably hundreds and hundreds of churches, especially in Illinois, Ohio, Missouri, actually all over the country, and uh, and they had done concerts and they had conducted services and and so a lot of people knew the crow family and so i would get introduced a lot of times well hi this is bob debbie crow's husband so i can kind of relate here to james just a little bit uh nobody knew me but everybody knew her and everybody knew my uh in-laws and, and their family james the brother of john and he was put to death and then it says that peter was arrested so it's likely that Peter, the apostle, the one whom Jesus had given the keys of the kingdom, is likely to be put to death. And so the Christians are huddled in their home, and in Acts chapter 12, verse 5, it says they were praying to God for Peter. They were practicing Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 and 8. But then a miracle happens. Peter's in jail. He's guarded and an angel appears, and it says the angel nudged him, woke him up, and said, come with me. And the angel leads Peter out of the prison, past the guards, and they get outside the prison, and all of a sudden, the angel vanishes. Just gone. Poof. The angel leaves Peter standing there all by himself. Like, what do I do? Well, he thought a moment. He didn't even realize what was going on. It says that he thought it was a vision. He thought it was a dream. He's, he's half awake and half asleep. And when he comes to his senses, he decides, well, I'll, I'll go find my brothers and sisters. And so he goes to the house where these Christians are meeting. And it says he knocks on the door. And a young servant girl, her name was Rhoda, uh, comes to answer the door. That was pretty common in those days. Uh, they would have an outer gate, and oftentimes they would send the children to go answer the gate or answer the door. Uh, this happens a lot when I'm in Haiti, when we go on mission trips. Uh, somebody will be at the door, and they'll knock on the door, and, and one of the children will go answer the door, and if they recognize the person that's at the door, they'll let them in. But if they don't recognize them, they'll come get an adult and say, hey, somebody's at the door, and I don't know who it is. You better go talk to them. And I picture that happening right here. But, but this, this young girl, her name is Rhoda, uh, got so excited. She was so overjoyed when she recognized it was Peter, she took off. She left him right at the door. He's standing right at the door. She didn't open the door. She didn't welcome him in. She just took off. Once again, twice in one night, Peter gets left standing by himself. I mean, i got to imagine he's about to get a complex by now. He's wondering, what in the world's going on? And she ran back to the Christians, and she says to them, Peter's at the door. Peter's at the door. And I love their response in Acts chapter 12, verse 15. They look at her, and they say, you're out of your mind. You are out of your mind. Reminds me, one of my favorite movies, Remember the Titans. There's a scene in that movie where Denzel Washington, the football coach, is uh, driving the boys rather hard, and, and one of the boys is getting tired, and he asks for some water. And Denzel begins to get on his case and let him know that that was inappropriate, and he looks at him, and at one point he says, Boy, you are outside your mind. Boy, you are outside your mind. Now, I don't know that they said that with this inflection, but they told her, you are out of your mind. This is the only time in all of Scripture that Rhoda is mentioned. One and only time. 
I mean, this is her moment. This is her, 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 her opportunity. This is her time in the limelight. This is her time to shine. She only had one task, open the door, and she blew it. And for all eternity, her failure and her mistake is recorded in Scripture. How would you like that to happen to you? I don't think I would. <laughs> uh, she didn't blow it too bad. She was excited, and she went back. But here's the curious thing. Now think about it. In verse 5, we're told that the Christians were praying to God. They were praying to God for Peter. And then when God answers their prayer, they don't buy it. They can't believe it. That's why I said repetition sometimes is good. You see, they knew they should pray. They understood. They intellectually agreed with the idea. They believed that God answered prayer, but they just didn't quite believe he was going to answer their prayer. You ever do that? I know I do. Oh, God! Help me! And then when he does, I'm almost amazed and surprised. And why should we be? Because he tells us in the Bible, ask, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. It's interesting, I did a word study on this word, knock. Um, it doesn't mean a gentle tap, like tap, tap, tap. It, it literally means to knock with the knuckles. It means a hard knock. When I was a little boy, about five years old, I experienced a rather traumatic experience. Um, I was attacked by a German shepherd, and that dog mauled me rather severely. And in order to get away, I tried to run to the house of the owner of the dog, and I began to knock on their door. And even to this very day, I can vividly picture in exact detail what that door looked like. It was a wood-framed, rickety screen door with a gold brass type handle, and it had a tear in the upper level of the screen. And I was knocking on the door, and believe you me, it was not a tiny knock. I was banging on that door. I was wanting to get their attention. I wanted them to come out here and take care of that dog. I was knocking on the door. Do you realize when we pray, when we ask, when we seek, and when we knock, we are literally and spiritually knocking on the door of heaven. The Bible tells us that. And bless his heart, that theologian Bob Dylan told us that as well in the song that he wrote. Knocking on heaven's door. Knock, knock, knocking on heaven's door. You see, when we go to God in prayer, we are knocking on heaven's door. And sometimes the answer doesn't come right away. And when that's the case, we just have to keep knocking. That's exactly what Peter did. When Rhoda ran back into the house and, did, and, and told the Christians, it says in verse 16 of Acts chapter 12, that Peter kept knocking. Peter kept knocking. Are there prayers in your life that have gone unanswered? Are there situations that you're stressed out about and you're wondering, am I ever going to get out of this? How in the world am I going to get out of this? And maybe you haven't seen the solution 
and you wonder, is God even aware? Does God even care? I am here to tell you, He is, and He does. And He promises that when you ask, it will be given to you. He promises that when you seek, you will find. And He promises that when you knock, the door will be open. I love Jeremiah 29, 13. You will, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. I want to close with a verse of scripture, which I've already shown you two or three times, um, but here it is. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Look, or some translations use the word, behold. I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together. I love that verse. Uh, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and if you open the door, Jesus says, I will come in and we're going to share a meal together. We're going to have a good time. We're going to do life together. There's a famous painting uh, entitled The Light of the World. It was painted in the mid-1800s by a guy by the name of William Hunt. And in this painting, he portrays this verse. He pictures Jesus in a rather allegorical, ethereal painting. And Jesus is at the doorstep of a home out what looks like in the woods that and the home and the door are overgrown with vines and weeds and, and and Jesus is just about to knock on the door and rather perceptively and intentionally the painter left out one tiny detail from the painting and you have to look rather close to see the detail that was left out. What he left out of the painting is the doorknob. When you look closely and inspect the door, there's no doorknob, there's no door handle on the outside. And he did that on purpose because this verse says, Jesus knocks, but we have to open, and that happens from the inside. We've got to turn the doorknob, and we've got to open the door and invite Jesus in. You see, Jesus won't crash the party. He won't break down the door of your heart. He won't use a battering ram. He will not force you against your will. Why? Because he loves you. He's given you free will and free choice. And when we come to Jesus, we have to do it willingly. It's up to us. He's knocking. We're on the inside. But if we we'll hear his voice and open the door, he'll come in and he'll share a meal with us. Jesus said, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved. You know, my greatest prayer this Easter is not really about the coronavirus. Don't get me wrong, I care greatly. And I am worried just like you are and concerned for families, for, for, for people who've contracted this virus. But you know what my greatest prayer is? My greatest prayer is that you and I get Jesus because he can overcome all things and regardless of the virus, and regardless of what happens in life, and regardless of whether death comes or not, we have a home eternal in the heavens with Him if we accept Him as our personal Lord and Savior. I can't think of a better time or a better reason or a better season to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you'd like to do that or you need to know how to do that, I want to encourage you, feel free to call us. Feel free to email me. Feel free to uh, call the church. We'd be glad to talk to you about that. We're going to close this uh, service with a special Easter prayer that I think you will find very appropriate.